Hi everyone. I'm here with Jennifer Palmer of Osea, and we will be over the next hour talking. Before we jump in, I just wanted to say after the session, please stick around for a bit. We'll be having happy hour where we will be playing plant-based business trivia. So if you want to join that afterwards, please stick around. And as always, write any questions you have in the questions tab, and we will try to get to it at the end of the session. So thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. Um, can you give us a little overview of who you are and what you do? Well, I'm the founder of OSEA. And um, I actually started the company 24 years ago. And it was kind of my third act in life, so to speak. I started out as an archaeologist. I'm, I will be 66 in a couple months. So, um, you know, when you, you get to a certain age, you get to go through many, many life cycles, which is actually really fascinating. So I started out as an archaeologist and then ended up doing cranial therapy many years and then when I was 42 I launched OC and skincare however I worked on it for many years prior so and Osea is an organic seaweed skincare based company and my idea I have this really kind of I always have to talk with my hands so when you see my hands flying around it's because I get very animated and passionate but uh, Osea actually means ocean, sun, earth, atmosphere. I wanted to create something that really represented the elements, not just of beauty, but of living. And it was really important to me that it was vegan. And interestingly, when I first started the company, my very first product, I even put a little bit of honey in it because I really wasn't aware that honey was considered a non-vegan food item. But it was, it was important to me to create a product where I actually spent all the money on the ingredients versus the marketing, the branding, the packaging. It was really fueled by this first question, almost obsession of what would happen if I spent all the money on the ingredients? Would anyone notice? Mm -hmm. and it took a long time for people to notice, but because I didn't have those kind of huge advertising marketing budgets. Yet, thanks to social media in the last five to seven years, people are noticing because people can tell the difference between a legitimate product and uh, just something that has is in a pretty bottle and filled with synthetic fragrance. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's kind of what we do and who we are. Awesome. And I noticed on LinkedIn, you list your title as the chief seaweed officer. So I'm curious, what led you to discovering seaweed as a beneficial skincare ingredient? Well, first off, I love that title because I am just not your CEO type and I'm not your president type. So I wanted to I wanted a title that really conveyed more of who I was. And actually what led me to seaweed is kind of like any good story, it began with my grandmother. And she was pretty much the first woman chiropractor. I, mean, I remember the second. She graduated in 1919, over a hundred years ago from chiropractic school. And she was so ahead of her time such a she really saw the future and she was I like to say that she was a feminist type a personality all those things before any of those words really existed mm -hmm. and she was such a workaholic also had six children I might add and a wonderful husband and she fell one time and injured her leg but nothing ever stopped this woman. I mean, she came into the United States when she was 16 by herself from Germany through Ellis Island wow. you know, with a few dollars. And parenting was really different back then because my great grandparents actually told her, hey, by the way, we sent your brother to the New World or to America. Um, 
10 years before, see if you can find him. He's somewhere in New York City. And can you imagine? And she did find him. And so this woman was tough as nails. So when she injured herself, she kept going and going and going until she ended up flat on her back in bed. And she tried everything, mustard pads, heating pads. And one night she had a dream. Now, in order to preface this, the night that the Titanic sank, my grandmother had a dream that the Titanic had sunk. And she woke up screaming in hysteria. And my grandfather actually thought he needed to call and get her put in a straitjacket. I mean, that was the level of anxiety that she was going through. And of course, then the next morning, everyone knew the Titanic had sank. And so, Whenever my grandmother said she had a dream, everyone in the family was like, oh, what happened? <laughs> you know, tell me more. <laughs> tell us about the dream. So she said, she told my grandfather, I had a dream that the ocean and seaweed would heal me. And I want you to carry me down to the beach and find seaweed, pack my body, and put me in the water. And he hesitated, but no one argued with this woman. She was a fierce, tiny little person, because it was December and it was in New York. She lived in Bayside Beach, New York. So the water was freezing. She went in. She felt, felt like she was a tad better. After a few weeks of being carried down every day, she started walking again. She and my grandfather swam, started the very first polar bear club and ended up swimming every day of the year, unless, this is my grandmother's definition of a bad day, I'm gonna do her German accent. That's the only way I know how to imitate her. She used to say, well, the ice was too thick to cut. <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. Yeah, so I grew up with this innate belief. It was in my family mythology that the ocean is healed. Um, you know, we all grew up with our belief systems, and I grew up between Toledo, Ohio, and Geneva, Switzerland, yet I always knew seaweed and the ocean was healing. And so that was just in my DNA. And then in the early 80s, I was a spa director at um, a, one of the very first and kind of historic Mineral Springs properties in Southern California. And people kept saying, oh, we should be doing facials. And I was maybe 27, 28 years old, and I was washing my face with water, some olive oil, putting some olive oil on my skin after. I was not into skincare, but I realized, all right, that seems like a, a good idea. Let's, let's figure out how to do facials. And I started looking for skincare, and I wanted skincare that was animal product free. I wanted skincare that was synthetic free. And guess what? There wasn't much around in the early 80s. And that's kind of when I realized, wow, I, I need to create something. So that's sort of how it began. And um, I had, since I had been, when I was a kid, we went on field trips to the perfume fields of grass. And, um, so I knew about essential oils, I knew about aromatherapy, and it just, without ever considering my grandmother, it just came into my mind that, what about taking seaweed and essential oils and that synergistic relationship between land and sea and combining them? And I'm a little embarrassed to admit that it wasn't until I launched years later and I was doing a training in front of a large group of estheticians and trainers that um, I uh, realized, oh my God, I'm here because of my grandmother and her belief in the sea. And I think that was my first moment in life when I saw how life is really a series of circles. And we go round and round and we complete those circles. So that was really the beginning. I saw the need. And it was tough in the beginning because 
part of the reason why I realized I wanted a natural product and there were so few options were so many companies tried to sell me their products and I had no idea what those synthetic ingredients were. So I had to literally order books from the FDA. I mean, I know this is hard for you, but there was a world before the internet and it was not as much fun as all of this. <laughs> It was special order books, wait a couple weeks, get it, dig through it, pack it up, take it back to the library. So that's really how I began my search. And it's really a journey. And I always say that, oh, see, it shows me. Because I was the least likely person to start a skincare company. I put on my one tube of lipstick for you all today. I don't wear makeup. I'm not a beauty person. Honestly, my idea of a great vacation is not even brushing my hair. I mean, that's how far away I am from beauty. But I saw the connection between health and what you put on your skin and how it actually goes into your body. And I was raised eating healthy foods. I mean, that was, let me tell you, it was quite an experience. Imagine this, 1958, my first day of kindergarten. I showed up with my, you know, a uh, little plastic container with a baked sweet potato, some tomatoes, um, some carrot sticks. I mean, and everybody else had, you know, bologna on white bread. So it was just a very kind of organic, natural progression. But I never would have chosen it for myself. Osea chose me. Wow, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Um, Segwaying into um, what you were talking about, about how your skin care and the products that you put on your skin affect the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about Osea's involvement in advocating for safe skincare products in general? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, I, I, it was really interesting because in 2001, I got a phone call from the Environmental Working Group, and they asked, would I consider signing this Global Pact for Safe Cosmetics? And the first thing out of my mouth was, of course, absolutely. It was the most logical thing in the world. So I, I signed the document, faxed it back to them, and they were all so excited and I came to realize so many companies had said no. And to me, I was the first signer. To me, it was just the most obvious thing in the world. And then I've had the opportunity to um, testify in the California State Legislature. Because the great thing about California is when we pass a law, we are such a large state that that law has to be enforced across the nation because otherwise it's for businesses there's too much revenue lost i mean california i i believe i mean i should probably fact check this that california was the state that pushed for you know get banning flame retardants on children's baby clothes and mattresses because if you can't sell your product in california you've lost a huge market share so that's why um, there's so much advocacy work that happens in California, and I'm really happy. The fragrance bill just got passed, where companies will have to fully disclose what's in their fragrance. And I've learned so much about that. And then a few years ago, which again was so inspiring, we um, we went to um, a beauty coalition. We went to D.C. and we actually talked to senators on both sides of the aisle and they were all so receptive which really warmed my heart I thought I you know how hard it is to see any kind of consensus I mean that's a understatement right now but uh, it was it was inspiring to see that this was a part of government that that actually is moving forward you know it's slow it's cumbersome but there's really interest on both sides of the aisle towards safe cosmetics because this matters and we live in a world of synthetic chemicals and so many new chemicals are being introduced into our environment every month every year that we're just in this cocktail and we don't really know how it all combines together right so 
it's, it's important and I really support people, you know, especially people in the clean beauty space or any kind of, any kind of environmental activities that it really is educational and it's inspiring to work with your local state legislatures and keep pushing it forward because change can occur. Yeah. Even when we think, you know, in some of our darkest moments that, well, where are we going? What's going on? But that change does occur slowly, slowly. Yes, absolutely. It's kind of like this whole um, Buddhist expression, which I love. It's kind of weird, but I love it. And it's slowly, slowly catch a monkey. Interesting. How else would you catch a monkey? That slowly, slowly. Yeah, very true. Yeah. I'm curious about if there are any specific challenges your company finds with having a plant-based derived product versus companies that use more chemical or synthetic derived products. Is there any differences in like supply chain? Or There's a lot of differences, but first I want to differentiate between plant-based versus using animal ingredients extracted from animals. There's no difference. I mean, it's so easy to make a vegan product. I don't know why everyone, I mean, it's, it's elementary. It's that it's so simple and obvious. The challenges are stability because if you have a drop of water in a formulation, then you need to be able to manage bacteria that grows in that formulation because water is the essence of life. It's different with powder or with an oil, but if you have a drop of water, which pretty much encompasses serums, cleansers, toners, masks, um, moisturizers, you need a preservative system. And finding a preservative system can be tricky. And um, natural derived ingredients, are way more expensive than synthetic derived ingredients, and there's variations. For example, one of our top selling products, Undaria algae oil, is um, it's really kind of a personal favorite. I, I love this product. I like to describe it as kind of the best product I ever formulated, and I didn't even have to really formulate it. What we do is we soak Undaria algae, which you might know as wakami or wakami, and um, we chop it up in little pieces and we soak it in organic botanical oils. It, depending on the season, up to six to eight months. And the walls, the polysaccharide walls of the seaweed break down and infuse the oil with minerals and make it this greenish, highly mineralized body oil that's incredible. It's not oily but it's highly moisturizing, very mineralizing. Yet, try to keep the color on that consistent because seaweed, depending on what time of year you harvest it, is going to have different shades and there's so many variables. And that was one of the things that I learned after I started my company. It was very important for me to package only in glass because of the environmental impact. Um, the, I'd already figured out 23 years ago the world had too much plastic. And the last thing we did was plastic bottles from our cosmetics in our garbage. And so I packaged in glass. And I thought, oh, it's so beautiful. You can see the product. Well, that's also problematic. That's why many companies package in opaque. So you can't see those colors variations or that little bit on the bottom like our our customers can will sometimes get upset with us because they call us I can't get that last little drop out and I'm thinking guess what you're not getting the last drop out of your tube either you just can't see it nor do you know it yeah so I'd say some of the challenges are consistency um, if you all of a sudden, maybe the entire organic lavender crop is out and you've got to look even harder. It's not just something that can be manufactured. I mean, there's a reason why we live in a chemical, synthetic chemical-based world, because it's highly efficient. 
it's just there are so many unintended consequences around it. Mm -hmm. So it's always a challenge, and the challenges are fun, right? Yes, exactly. Um, another question I have is, you mentioned that um, extracting plant-based ingredients versus animal-derived ingredients mm -hmm. are easy. What led to your decision to leave these things out? Was that uh, something planned ahead of time or? Oh, no, I was very conscious. I was a vegetarian and I thought, why do I need to kill animals to make a beauty body? There's nothing beautiful about that. It was a very conscious decision. Okay. And we have everything we need in plants. You know, I mean, the plant kingdom, especially when you're working with land plants and ocean plants. I mean, between seaweed and land plants, you got it all. Right. So, and thank you for reading the questions because I don't know if they're on my screen, but I'd have to put my face right next to it. I'm a little nearsighted. So, glad okay. you're reading them out to me. <laughs> and um, so, what advice did you do you wish you had gotten when you first started your company? Um, I think two pieces of advice, well, probably three. And I'll, as I start talking, the list might get longer. I did not understand the true benefit of building a team. I wish someone had just sat me down from day one and looked me straight in the eye and said, you're only as good as your team. I was a single mom. I was used, to, I was an only child. I was a single mom. I was used to just doing everything myself. So I didn't appreciate the value of building the team. And that was something that I wished I'd known. Also, no one explained to me the benefit of a mentor. And I think that having a mentor, it really puts you on a fast track. And the last thing, and certainly for me, and um, I like to call myself, uh, you know, the tortoise and the hare. Well, you're, you're looking at the tortoise, but guess who won the race? So it, it takes longer than you think it will take. I truly thought that where I was, I really thought like, oh, by year three, well, I would be at X amount of revenue. Well, you know what? That was more like year 12. I was slow, but at the same time, I worked really hard to maintain work-life balance because it was the only way I knew how to be. I had to put my children first. And um, because I knew I, you only had one chance as a parent. I mean, that, those, that 18 years flies by. And I was so lucky, not only... And I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I was so lucky because not only did I put my children first, but they came back to Osea, and especially my oldest daughter, Melissa, she has grown the business exponentially in the last five years. So here's what I'm going to say. I was really lucky. I was able to monetize parenthood. <laughs> the ultimate goal. I mean, that's like winning the Super Bowl. I monetized motherhood. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. But you know what? I think there's, I think it's really powerful when you put your priorities correct. Everything ultimately works out. But one must have patience and one must have belief. And you really have to just believe in yourself, no matter what everyone else says around you. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm curious, as a person that follows a lot of beauty brands on social media, what role does social media play in your business? It has been so incredible, and I have to take zero credit for that. That is completely my daughter, Melissa, and my younger daughter, Mary. The two of them have just really built our social presence. And it's been wonderful because I love the community that we've built and the connection and the interaction. And it's so, 
was never my dream. I mean, the thought of advertising and having a big color page ad in some beauty magazine, I mean, please, I don't buy any of the products. I, I mean, I don't relate to any of that. So social has been a way for us to really communicate our message and to build our community. And we've, we've really learned from members of our OSEA community. We've listened to them. We've made subtle improvements, improved our packaging, um, been inspired to create new products. It, it's, it really makes you feel good to be a part of something. And, you know, and prior to COVID, which seems hard to imagine almost at this point, you know, when <laughs> right. prior to COVID at our, um, we used to do a lot of events at our space on Abbot Kinney and we would host all types of speakers and environmentalists and we'd have vegan chefs. And I mean, it was really a gathering place. And it was absolutely wonderful. I, I felt like I got to, show up at a party that the team had created and I would meet all these wonderful people. And I didn't have to do the dishes either. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So. Can you talk a bit more about opening that space? Again, I want to give credit to my daughter. And this is really, this is such an interesting story. Story. We were ready. We knew we needed to move out. We were working out of a small. Well, first, let me say we worked out of um, my garage in Malibu for mm, fifteen years, and um, and then we finally outgrew the garage. And I would like to just suggest that to any entrepreneurs that are starting, keep your fixed monthly costs as low as possible. You know, it does. It doesn't matter. You don't need that office and all those things. Like bootstrap it for as long as you possibly can, and um, and use the money elsewhere. Well, when we finally had a team, and um, we were in this tiny little rental house in Malibu, um, Melissa was ready to sign a lease at a larger space, and she woke up the morning that she was supposed to sign the lease with just this pit in her stomach and said, "It's not right." Meanwhile, all the furniture that was going to be moved to the new office was in the front yard waiting, you know, for the van to come pick it up. And here, and we had to move out of the house we were in because it was getting sold. And so she just said, I'm going to find a place right now. And it was that determination and that focus and that passion. And she went out and she went down Abbott Kinney, which is kind of the it street in Venice. And, um, there was this little tiny building with a tiny little handwritten sign in the corner and she called up the phone number and immediately showed up with a cashier's check for the whole amount. And she rent, she had it rented in two hours and everything that was in the front yard went straight into that office. And it was great. And it really created a center for us and a presence. And we also have a small retail store. So we have a retail store front facing Abbott Kinney and we have a huge courtyard where we held a fence and then we had the office space behind it. Awesome. Yeah. Great. I think we're gonna open up to some questions. So first question is from Teresa. I own a vegan beauty and wellness business. What advice do you have for someone just starting out? Well first of all Teresa I love to support women in business. And I think that it's so important that women always support each other in business. So perhaps find a business networking group of women. Um, I think you'll find it really effective. Um, again, keep your monthly costs as low well as possible. I think it's really important to look at if when you save $100, that's not just saving $100. That's equivalent to making two or $300. Because when you make two or $300, you have your cost of goods, you have your expenses, you have the taxes that you pay on that money. So every, every way that you can conserve money will really serve you. 
And also I find that when you conserve money, you tend to go much more gentle on the environment because there is something, I don't really like this word. Maybe you can think of a better word, you know, like frugal. It's not really my favorite word, maybe because it sounds kind of funny. But when you conserve your money, it has a conservation effect all around. And I think that that's also another suggestion I would offer. Awesome. And a question for me, is there any particular um, business failure or a challenge that happened that ended up being a blessing in disguise or you learned a lot from? Ooh, that would be a long list. That could almost be another segment. <laughs> I'll tell you one of the challenges, and for anyone starting a skincare company or probably makeup company in particular, is packaging. It seems like such an easy thing, and it is can be so challenging. For example, buying 50,000 pumps, which was way more pumps than I ever should have bought, but the sales guy was so great. And, you know, like when you're in sales – you can't help it. You love to get sold. I mean, that's so be aware of that. You know, like you know it's happening. You know you're getting sold, and you're just you're on the wave. You can't help it. And um, so I bought fifty thousand pumps when I really needed five thousand. Also, only to discover that the dispension on those pumps was terrible. So now I was stuck with fifty thousand pumps. I had all my money tied up in these fifty thousand pumps. And I literally just had to use them all up and kind of subject my consumers to it. Luckily, we have really dedicated OCA fans. And they've, they've, ridden, they've ridden the wave with some of our packaging fiascos. So that was certainly things around packaging, I would say, are one of the biggest challenges. Yet, once you learn that lesson, you learn that lesson. And I think, I think that's the key in business. We all make mistakes, but it's learning from them, which makes you stronger, and you just have to keep pushing forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Um, this question is from Mandy. Where do you see the future of OSEA heading? Oh, I have so many ideas. Um, I love skin. I have maybe hair, maybe... Um, functional fragrance. Um, something that we're really excited about is um, I'm very, you know, the whole microbiome. And we're, we actually are creating a small collection called C-Biotics where we're merging pre and probiotics with seaweed. And I think that that's going to have a really great effect on the skin. So that's one, I mean, that's one direction. I, you know, as I said, Osea chose me, and I'm kind of just riding the wave with it. Awesome. I'm also really excited. I Since I come from a wellness background, I mean, I had that slight digression when I was younger, right out of college doing archaeology. But having worked in the wellness space of cranial therapy and being, you know, the granddaughter of a chiropractor, I wanted to start creating wellness products. So the first true, I mean, I always see our products as healthy and healing for the skin, but really sort of that first true wellness product is our Vegas nerve oil, which couldn't have made it at a better time. Ironically, we launched the Vegas nerve oil literally a few weeks before my home burned down in Malibu two years ago. And I couldn't live without it on my neck all the time. I mean, I was just all over that. But the, doing the Vegas nerve oil, the pillow mist to induce sleep, that's in our newest launch. And the Vegas nerve activates the parasympathetic nervous system and puts people into a deeper state of relaxation. So that's kind of one new exciting direction that I love. Brings me to is there a book or a podcast that you're loving lately that you would want to recommend? Oh, my God. Okay. Well, my husband's in the other room. I have the biggest crush on Trevor Noah. 
I love him. <laughs> and I, I am, I'm listening actually to the audio book. And normally I'm a reader, but I'm listening to his audio book, Born a Crime, because he does all the different voices. And it's so inspiring. And, you know, as I said, he's my, he's my celebrity crush. Awesome. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, what is the most exciting thing you're working on right now? It's done and it's coming out is our sunscreen. It will be out next spring and it's actually, it literally took me over 20 years to work and develop the concept. Um, I don't want to give away too much, but I don't wear sunscreen because I don't like how they smell. I don't like how they affect my skin. I mean, do yes, I believe in sun protection, but I'm that person with huge hats, oversized sunglasses, and you should see me when I swim. I'm a swimmer. I have like long sleeves. I, I, I look pretty ridiculous when I get in the water, but even down to like, I have a little swim hoodie, but I'm really excited about our sunscreen that's coming up. And um, I'm also really excited about our whole C-Biotic microbiome collection as well. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, and you know what else I'm excited about? Check out these brows. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Put it in for a 66 year old, because guess what? Those brows thin out when you get older. So yes, of course I've always had good brows, but because I have an autoimmune Hashimoto's disease, my brows had gotten shorter and shorter, like they were to about here. And you know, first I just thought, oh, I'm getting older, my brows are thinning, but then I realized they look kind of weird. And we, um, we, we will be launching it, I'm not sure when, but I made my own personal stash and I've been using it for four months now and check it out. The brows are back. Awesome. Yeah. Is that, would that be a brow gel or? It would be a two part system, morning and evening. And yeah, it's a brow enhancer. And a lot of people do those already, but we have a really interesting twist on it because I like to create innovative products. If someone's made it, great they've made it. I mean, there's so many beautiful products out and there's so much innovation now in the clean beauty space that for me, when I see a product well done, I'm so excited. I'm not going to copy it. I, I want to create something unique and different for our collection. Right. This question is from Mandy. You talked about how sustainable packaging is something that's important to you. Have you found yourself having conversations with other brands to, uh, to promote sustainable packaging efforts? Actually, I'm part of the, um, I'm part of a, uh, oh, I just blanked out the name. I work with the Breast Cancer Fund Partners and they have a whole kind of advisory board. I, I forgot the title of it, but we do get together, like we have quarterly meetings and we share our information. We usually have experts come and there's a lot of really interesting leaders in the industry and we get to share the challenges. It was interesting when I first launched, pretty much every cosmetic company used plastic or acrylic and it's just absolutely thrilling now to see all the glass or to see the aluminum bottles. There really has been a tremendous reduction, um, you know, in plastics. What we have to get rid of next are all those little hotel room plastic bottles. And finally, some of the real top tier luxury properties are going towards dispensers. Because, you know, that's one of the biggest things in landfills. All those little tiny containers that people feel the need to take home with them because it's free. And, hey, I've done it too. So, But once you realize the environmental impact of it, you know, those all have to go. If you could start over 
with Osea, is there anything you would change? I would probably um, use white glass bottles instead of clear glass bottles. <laughs> I mean, and that's maybe about the only thing I would change other than the mistakes I made early on that it took me so long to realize the value and the importance of building a team. But um, I, I, I was going to just pick sort of a, it seems like such a little random detail, but it would have been a lot easier to sell our products in opaque glass. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I think we're being more truthful and honest with our customer because they can see exactly what's inside the bottle. And they can see if the lab didn't fill it quite to the top, it's all yeah. there. You know, so... Maybe I wouldn't change anything. Where do you, what do you see the future of the beauty space looking like going forward? The beauty of what? The, the beauty industry? The future of the beauty industry in general? Um, I think that it's all going to, I think that it's going towards clean beauty and it's also going towards safe synthetics. I think that's one of the biggest trends right now. Um, using the ingredients that have been more extensively tested without the type of um, side effects on your endocrine system or irritation, etc. So I would say those two directions. Safe synthetics. And you know, there's stores, there's, there's some really great um, stores now that like kind of clean beauty stores like Credo and Blaine, and they have such a beautifully curated boutiques and they put so much thought and attention and detail into it. And I think that's where beauty is going more and more. And I think that clean is going mass. People are realizing that, you know, it's not just a California, New York thing. Everywhere people are realizing that what you put on your skin is pretty what you put on your skin and you're putting in your body. Absolutely. Michaela asks, do you have any products directed at combating Hashimoto's? No, and I wish I did. I've been actually I've been most successful with my Hashimoto's with weekly acupuncture, which I have not been able to do recently because of COVID and um, Chinese herbs. No, I mean, Hashimoto's is tricky, but I have reversed. Most people, when they have Hashimoto's, the way that it is evaluated is how high are your antibodies. And usually once you get Hashimoto's, you take thyroid medication, and your antibodies continue to go up, and then you have to keep increasing your medication. And my antibodies, I've cut in half. So I'm excited about that. And Kathy asks, in your opinion, are there any successful animal-based beauty ingredients that cannot be substituted with a plant-based ingredient? Well, I'm not sure my opinion really counts because I've never really studied animal-based ingredients. I mean, I know there's placenta. I know there's animal collagen for internal. I know that topically animal collagen is too large a molecule. I mean, it just sits on top of the skin. I know shark oil and whale, whale oil. Well, you know, I'll tell you one thing. And again, I'm far from an expert. This is, this is merely an opinion. And I, I like to, I believe that you have to weight opinions. I mean, if, when a medical doctor gives you an opinion on something, I weight that opinion much more highly than when my when a plumber gives me an opinion on a medical condition, and vice versa. I'm totally listening to the plumber when I'm talking what to do with my pipes and drains. So I'm hardly an expert, but I would say that year, years ago they used to use um, – animal fat from whales as a base for perfume. And that's been really hard to duplicate. And that's where all the synthetics have tried to duplicate it. Clearly I'm not interested in whale fat for perfumes. And I, you know, I just, who needs a placenta or collagen or 
shark oil when you have an entire world of mechanical and an entire ocean of sea weeds. Absolutely. I'm not seeing any other questions. If anyone has anything else to ask, now's your time. Otherwise, thank you so much, Jennifer, for being with us today and speaking with us. And it was great learning about you and Osea. And um, thank you so much. I'll see you backstage. Yes, I so appreciate you inviting me. And um, I just want to wish any entrepreneurs out there, you can do it and believe in yourself. And especially, you know what, the United States was built on small businesses. And, you know, small businesses are so important. And it's important that we support our small and local businesses. And, um, you know, I kind of have a, uh, a new sort of life motto nowadays um, because, you know, it, it's been a rough six months, I think, for all of us. And it's just now I like to say I'm living life on the bench. So. <laughs> Great. All right. I think we're going to wrap up and in a few minutes we'll start happy hour and trivia. So okay. thank you so much. Bye.